Good evening to everyone. Giving our praise to God the Father and to His Son, our Savior, and to our Lead, our Teacher, our God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, truly, we thank God for those that are present on tonight. We also thank God for those that are online on tonight. And we have a, another very helpful lesson. Uh, our subject is a plea for Christ-like forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And our scriptures come from Solomon uh, chapter 1, verse 4 through verse 21. So we got a lot of scriptures on tonight. And again, our subject is a, pre, a plea for Christ-like forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> I'm, I can say this, and I mean it. Christ-like forgiveness, we all come up short. Yes, sir. He tells us we have to forgive one another. Yes, sir. Even in the, the, the uh, uh, model prayer, forgive us of our debts. As we forgive, as we forgive our debt talk. That's mm -hmm. when we're forgiving each other. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about Christ-like forgiving, Christ showed how much he forgiven by dying out young on Cabbage Crop. Mm -hmm. Now this lesson, I hope we can understand the lesson. Uh, it it seems somewhat strange uh, because this our lesson is dealing with a slave owner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like a slave owner and Christianity does not go together. Same that way. It's same that way. Yeah. But I tell you what, when I got into this lesson, uh, this man was being led by the Holy Spirit. Yes, That's right. You know, it, it is a powerful lesson, you all. Know? And like Deacon Gibble was saying, we have to learn how to forgive. And I know people say all the time, I forgive, I, I forgive, and I forget. No. I don't go along with that forgetting part because God made us with a memory bank. And when someone does something that's really shocking to you or really knocks you off your feet, it's hard to forget that. But when he's talking, telling us to forgive and forget, now you got to forgive that person. And that forget part is does, do not let that hinder you in no shape, form, or fashion. If something come up and that person needs something for you, from you, you got to go ahead on and do what Christ would do. Right. You got to you got to block that out. You don't let that hinder you. That's right. You know, uh, and people say I forgive you and I forget it, but uh, that, that we got a memory bank and that memory bank whole thing, but we can't let that hinder us from helping someone. That's right. And, and when Satan tried to use that, we have to we have to get beyond that. Now. I think the Deacon Gilbert read some very important scriptures, you all. Uh, uh, and before we get into the lesson, he read them, but I want them read again. Thank you, Deacon Gilbert. Uh, Philemon was a wealthy Christian slave owner whose estate was around Colossus. Mm -hmm. Now, he dealing, we, we, we coming out of the Colossian church, but his estate was there in Colossus. That's right. Uh, uh, but he was part of Paul's team. Now, Paul had not met him, but he heard about his work. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, he what was different about him is what his focus was on. Normally, the wealthy deals with the wealthy. But this wealthy man was dealing with Christian, and most of these Christians was, for as a, their social standing, it was lower than the upper class that was wealthy enough to own slaves. And that's what make this man stands out uh, 
the fact that he focused on Christianity, a social lower class of people, rather than on the upper class. And the key to this man is he was living for God, having compassion for God's people. Amen. And to him, which it ought to be to everybody, it's not about what class you are. Because in God's eyes, we all are the same. There's no Bible scripture that I know of said that we were all created equal, but it said God had no respect to person. So we all are the same in God's sight. This is man coming up with this upper class and this lower class and all this other stuff. Um, but but this, is, this, this man is something else. And also, before we get into the lesson, thank you, Deacon Gibbard. We want to go back, and I want someone to re read uh, Colossians. I, I think it's 2, 3, no, no, excuse me. Uh, Colossians 7, 8, and 9. That's what I want you to read. Colossians 7, 8, and 9. Which chapter? Uh, chapter 4. All my state shall to Kairos declare unto you who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Okay. You hear what they said about this man? He's talking about Solomon. Mm -hmm. He is a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. Now this is how Paul is identifying him as a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord on his slave. Okay, so. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he might know your estate and comfort your heart. Okay, stop right there. Now, what, what they're saying now, he's getting ready to send Yeah, uh, he getting ready to send Onesimus. Paul is getting ready to send him. He's a runaway slave. And Paul is getting ready to send him back. Now, Sister Porter, would you read verse 9? Listen closely, y'all. With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. Now, when he get back, uh, uh, this guy, uh, Ta Ashios, is going to take him back with this letter from Paul, mm -hmm. explaining everything. Now, uh, Onesius is also going back with him. He, he's sending him back to his owner with a letter, explaining to him everything that had went on. He's in Rome. The runaway slave made his way to Rome. Okay. And somewhere in Rome, he ran into Paul. And running into Paul, he got converted. And once he got converted, Paul found out this man is something. Now, you know, it was limited. Paul was not just confined to the sales. He had a, a restricted area that he could travel. But when he got this man here, this, this slave, this runaway slave, he had more reign. He could even go farther than Paul could. And he was going in Rome telling them about Jesus Christ. So with all this, Paul wanted him to take this report back to Philemon mm -hmm. uh, about this, this runaway slave of you. Okay. Because now remember what he was. He was a minister. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, he was a faithful minister of the Lord. Can I ask you a question? Sure, yes. Okay. In the letter that he was sending, this was to let him know that he wasn't the same. He was a chained man. He was a chained man. man. That's what he would let him know. Okay. He, he's, he's a new man in Christ Jesus. Now don't think about what he used to no, be. No, don't think about what he used to be. Okay. And another thing, now, since she brought this out, I, I don't want to, I got all these scriptures. <laughs> now, he had the right to do whatever he wanted to with him being a runaway slave. Right. He could beat him. He could sell him. He could even kill him. But, but, but Paul's saying he's a jeweler now. Yeah. And, so, and, and thank God for Deacon Gibbard went back to bring us up on there. But I wanted to make sure we, we, we get that again. Yeah. Now before we get into the lesson, and he also read that, uh, would you go to Philemon? Uh, just, yeah, say, do two and three real quickly. And to our beloved Aphia, 
and Archippus, our fellow soldier. Now, 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 this Philemon, go ahead, what verse you on? Two. Two. Okay, I cut you off too quick. And to our beloved Athia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. In thy house. So this wealthy man let the church be set up in Colossia in his house. Now this uh, Philia, that was probably his wife. And this uh, Chippius, it may be his son. In other words, and the church is set up in their house. Everybody cannot let a church be set up in their house. Because if you let the church be set up in your house, it's going to be limited on where you can go in somebody's house. It's going to be limited on what you can do in somebody's house. People are not comfortable to just come. It's not good to try to set a church up in somebody's house. But this man did it. And he was making progress. Uh, uh, read, what did you read, two? Yes. Read three. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace. So he had he he heard about the good work that this man was doing. Paul was very impressed uh, with the message that he got about the great work that this man was doing, letting them set a church up in his house. And uh, we're going to get into the lesson. Now look what he says here. Uh, uh, this is Paul. Paul said, "I thank my God." making mention of thee always in my prayer. So, hearing of the love and faith which thou had toward the Lord Jesus and toward all of the saints. That, he's telling us something. He thanked my God making mention of thee always in my prayer. How often Let's be honest with ourselves. How often do we pray one for the other? How often do we as a family of people pray one for the other? Is our prayers up? What do you say, Sister Sheila? I said not as often as we should. Now he said he prays how often? Always. Always. Who said that? Philemon. Somebody said always. Who said that? That's right. He praying always. So much, sometimes our prayers are just selfish. Sometimes our prayers are just for our family or for somebody else we know, but we ought to be praying one for the other. And this is what praying, Paul, the letter said, Paul said, I'm praying always uh, that this man is always in his prayer. And like Deacon Gibbons said, we ought to be taught these lessons and we ought to practice, practice what we learn out of the lesson. We need to be praying one for another. We're in a spiritual warfare. We had that lesson. And Satan attack all of us. Don't y'all think just because I'm the pastor and I'm the preacher and I teach and I preach that I don't get beat up with the worldly activities? Don't think I don't have problems? Don't think stuff going in my life that sometimes I lay down at night and I can't sleep. <coughs> so we need to always be praying for each other. Look what he said in verse 5. Hearing of thy love and faith which thou had toward the Lord Jesus and toward all of the saints. This man is concerned about, now here he is rich, Joe. He's a wealthy man. He owned a slave. Uh, and he allowed the church, he's a minister of God, uh, allowed them to set the church up in his house, and he, he is praying for, he's praying for them every day. Now, let me share this with you. Now, if one of us would allow him to set a church up in our house, you ain't going to be praying for something the way they're going to act in your house. So the time that you be praying that they don't come back. <laughs> but this man here, I, I was saying to them, Reverend Joe, he didn't seem normal to me for a slave owner to be a Christian. 
But if we get off into this lesson, uh, we're going to find out that he's been led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, hearing of the, this love that he has, this is not the kind of love uh, a romance or uh, sexual love. Eros, nor filial love, like a brotherly love. And you know what kind of a lot of love we have in the church that's dangerous? You know what kind of love we have in the church? We have love dealing with friendships and relationships. Well, I could have a friend, and because of our friendship and our relationship, I, I, I show more love to him. And even when he needs to be corrected or coming with some crazy stuff, the kind of love I have for him, I just go along with this stuff. Mm -hmm. That's dangerous. Now, this love that we're talking about here in verse 5, this is what you call agape love. Yeah. This is unconditional love that this man has for the church. The kind of love he has, let us do God's will. And that's the kind of love that we ought to have. We ought to love each other and we ought to love the world. And if God sends somebody here to visit us, we ought to have enough love for them that it's the kind of love they can feel that love that I want to be part of what's going on here. And if we're not careful, we don't have that kind of love, we go to looking at the people kind of strange. And let me tell you something. When love is real, you can, you can feel it. Yeah. This man has a real love, but Paul is going somewhere with this. <laughs> Yeah, he's building this up or something. Yeah. You know. In verse 6, uh, 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 again, we should pray for uh, each other and we should ask the Lord to help us with this agape love. Because how does God love uh, Jesus tell us to love? Love is such an important word. Love is something we overlook all the time. He said the first thing we ought to do is love God the Father with all our heart, soul, and mind. And then after we love him, then he said, tell us to do what? Love ye one another. Mm -hmm. And if we love God with all our heart, our soul, we will be a family of people. Mm -hmm. And we would want to see the whole world saved. And we would do whatever we could to help save the world. We get selfish. And I heard in your prayer, they can give us some time we come because it's a tradition that we come in here on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we come because there's nothing else to do. Then he got in that verse 6 that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Paul is going somewhere. He's acknowledging Philemon's good works. The good works that he has toward Jesus Christ and the church. We do know Christ is the head of the church. And at this point, he's encouraged him on about his good works. And the reason he carried it, encouraged him on, never get satisfied thinking that my work is good enough. Yes. Never get content thinking that my work is good enough. Sometimes I use athletes in this. One of the worst things could happen to an athlete, and you see it all the time. No, he's good, and he know he's good. So he doesn't put the effort in, in everything he does because I know I'm good. You have a lot of great athletes, they end up getting kicked off the team because they stuck on their own set. And I don't care how good you, just like somebody is less than him, not as good as he is, that guy's always trying to improve. But you think just because I'm good, I'm satisfied with how good I am? I always try to do better. And this is what Paul is telling them. You're doing good work, but keep striving to do better. Now he's talking to the church. Same thing with us. We ought to always be striving. Don't get comfortable with just being saying things are all right with me. How can things be all right with us when we see people living under the bridges. How can things be all right with us when we see people walking around here with all they own in a shopping cart? How can we content, be content? The little girl that they just found today. 
all this killing, mass killing, the condition that the world is in, how can I be content with the condition that the world is in? So Paul is telling this man, he's encouraging him on, acknowledging of every good thing which is right here, which is in you in Christ Jesus, but he let him know you can do better because I'm getting ready to test you, boy. He's getting ready to be tested. You know, and all he's done, he's building him up for something. Verse 7, for we have great joy and consolation in thy love. Because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by thee, brother. Now, what he's telling him, the report that he got about what's going on in the church in Colossae. This church is in Colossae. And he's telling, and he, he's telling him that, that he have great joy and consolation in, in the love because the bowels of the saints are being refreshed. What do you mean the bowels of, of the saints? Of being free. He heard that people are growing in your church. Yeah. People are being energized in your church. Yeah. And the reason they're growing and the reason they're being, they're being nourished in your church. Yeah. Thank you, Deacon Give. They're being fed in your church. What are we doing out here on the night? We're trying to feed God's people. Yeah. But if you don't take the food, you don't get the nourishment you need. You're not going to be strong in the battle that we're in. And that's what he's talking about, the bow, refreshed. And he's talking about because of their bow, the, the, the heart, the inner, inside of the people. And let me tell you something. Don't fool yourself. You might run around here talking about you're a Christian. But what's on the inside of you going to show up on the outside. And when you real on the inside, you don't have to tell nobody no, you no Christian. Mm -hmm. They can look at you and tell. And that's why he keep on talking. That's why it's so important when he talk about the fruit of the spirit. Right. I'm a country boy, and ain't no way I'm gonna walk up to a fig tree and you're gonna tell me it's an apple tree. <laughs> and I see the fruit on the tree. Right. If we got love, peace, joy, and all that inside of us, it's gonna show up on the outside. So what's going on here at this church that Philemon has allowed to come into his house? The saints are being refreshed. The vows, the inside of them, the works are good. He see good works going on here. And like I say all the time, when I'm, I had to make some adjustment on myself, but try to because the first thing I'm thinking, it's a slave owner? You, you find a slave owner with these qualities? Nobody got no business owning nobody else. Yeah. But this is what's going on in our lesson. And then he get in the verse. Uh, uh, now this is why did I know this, this, this verse right here, this verse number seven, when he's talking about uh, uh, we have a great joy and consolation. And that consolation saying being consoled uh, in our love. And, that, and, that, and, and we keep on saying that word love. And this kind of love that Paul is seeing out of this church is that agape love. This church is really trying to reach out and save people. Now you do know that they were having problems uh, before they, these people that's in the church in Colossae broke away from some of those churches where they had so much problem about customs and tradition. The deep people broke away. They got tired of this old stuff about you got to be circumcised. Uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the law and all of this. So they they just off doing a good work about doing the work of Jesus Christ who died for them. I don't care every while they were yet sinner. But this thing here, I find out that in that seventh verse, the reason that the church is operating the way it's operating is not just because of Philip. It's because of the third member of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is having his way. The Holy Spirit would love to have his way in any church, but how can the Holy Spirit have his way if you're not putting nothing on the inside of it? He's talking about these bowels. He's talking about what's in them. Because we do know what the Holy Spirit does, right? 
teacher. But it teach you what? It teach you what you've been put inside of you in Bible lesson. It bring things to your memory. So if ain't nothing put inside of you, and this is what he's saying, is what he's getting out of the bowels, out of the inside, this is the work of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to tell nobody. I was working with a, 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 a guy one time, he said he was a preacher, Reverend Joe, and he had Jesus wrote on the back of his neck, and I asked him, why did you put Jesus on there? He said, well, I know you're not supposed to, uh, the Lord said don't put no marks on your Bible. He said, man, I got Jesus on my neck. He said, I, I thank God. I said, no, sir. If he said, don't write on your body, he meant that. And you don't have to write Jesus on the back of your neck to show that. Mm -hmm. What he needed you to do is to live Jesus. Yeah. People to see you living Jesus, that's what God wants. They don't want you to write nothing on you. Live this. And I believe this is what Paul is so, uh, 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 what's touching him uh, the way it is about this church it, it, because these people are living it. He keeps talking about their bowels. He's going to talk about what's on the inside of them. Uh, where, verse 8, wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake. You see, he keeps talking about this love. He's getting ready to test this man's love. And we all talk about love all the time. But this is not the love that you have for another member in the church. This is not love because of your relationship with another member or your uh, 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 friendship. This kind of love he's talking about is inspired by what Christ did out yonder on Calvary. For love's sake, Rather, I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aid, and now also prisoner of Jesus Christ. Uh -uh. If you go back to verse 1, Paul did not use his apostolic authority in this epistle, this letter. But here he is, later on in here, mentioning the fact of his age. Now, some of them say Paul is around about 60 years old at this time, but I believe he's older than that. Because this is 60 AD. And Paul was a young man when he gave the okay to stone Stephen to death. So here we find, here uh, uh, Paul did not use his apostolic authority but he did mention his age. And what he's talking, he's talking about what being a disciple of Jesus Christ have done to his body. He's talking about the wear that have been put on his body. He's talking about the tear oh, yeah. that has put on his body. He's talking about the suffering. He's talking about all of the affliction that he have went through. How they tortured his body. He, he's talking about, and now here I am down here a prisoner in Rome. And I'm doing all this carrying the gospel, the good news. And I'm carrying, I'm doing all I can. I, I didn't just be satisfied being around Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria. I'm taking this gospel all over the world. And this is why I'm all, seems like I'm older than I ought to be. Because I'm a workaholic for the Lord. I'm taking the gospel to the Lord's world. Now he's on his way with this somewhere. Because here he is in Rome. Trying to get it as far as he can get it in Rome. And although he's got limitations. Now I, a, a man that's on the run has ran into me. And he can go into areas that I can't go. And this gospel is to be delivered all over the world. Jesus' last word, go ye therefore teaching all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Teaching them to observe all things. Whatsoever I had taught you. 
the people who was hopeless. That's who Paul is getting to. This is where the gospel ought to be getting. To people that are hopeless, to people that are lost. And this is what the church ought to be about. Because when God sent his son, Paul trying to get, he trying to get it all over the world. Yeah. And, and look what God said when he sent his son. He said, for God so loved Egypt, I mean Israel, God so loved the church, God so loved Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, God so loved the world. He wants this gospel all over the world. And here Paul sent an opportunity. And he's headed somewhere. <laughs> Verse 10. I beseech thee. For my son. Onesim, Onesimus. Who has begotten in my bond. Now, he, now this is the door being opened. Out of everything that he's been telling him, he's he been commending him on doing a great job. And I don't think Paul is not the type of person who's just trying to butter somebody up. Paul has got good news about the great work that's going on in this church. Now, he led this man up until this 10 verse. And that word beseech is... It, Sometimes I, I use the word a, a, a plea that's going out to you. Someone like I, I, I beg thee for my son Onesimus. Notice what he's calling the runaway slave now. Son. He's calling him my son mm -hmm. whom I have begotten in my bond. While I'm here in jail, here in Rome, I done picked up a son here in Rome behind these balls. He's sending this letter to Philemon, telling him the good news. They can give a read those scriptures. Take this report back to him. Yeah. And not only take the report, I'm sending this man back with the letter to you. Verse 11 which in time past was not the, which in time past was to the unprofitable. But now profitable to thee and to me. Now, why was he unprofitable to him in time past. I'm going to tell you my belief. The scriptures don't tell us this. Some men won't just accept being no slave. Some men would not accept, before I be a slave, just kill me. Just take me out because I'm not going to be no slave. I'd rather be dead than be a slave. And if this man had this, this attitude, he was not profitable right. to find him. In other words, he, he probably had hell dealing with this guy every day. And I try to find out a little bit more on, on what he was doing. It doesn't tell us, but, but he probably had a, a, a job, a certain duty that he needed to do. And this man could have been using that. It, 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 not, not so much as him being an abusive slave master, but it's still the man had a job he had to go out and do every day. Yeah. And if you don't want to be no slave, it's hard for you to go out and do whatever you need to get done. And he probably was a headache to the man. And that's why he ran away. Oh, that boy name uh, Kuta Kente? Yeah. Kuta Kente, I can't, I, any opportunity you give me, I'm getting out of here. Because I'm not going to be no slave. And I can see the same thing in this man. And this is why he said, when you had him, he was unprofitable. When you had him, he was a headache. When you had him, you had to check on him all the time. 
And I imagine that he looked at you and put a little fear in you the way he looked at you. But he let him know, but now, in verse 11, he's profitable unto thee just like he's profitable unto me. And Paul said, I've been around this man a long enough note that he is what? A changed man. Because the man have been reconciled. He's been reconciled to me, Paul. And not only has he been reconciled to me, Paul said, I'm looking at this one. He's been reconciled to Jesus Christ. And he's out here every day that he has an opportunity to go out, going out telling them about one who died out here on Calvary. He is a servant of Jesus Christ. And the fact, uh, uh, Philip, Philemon, now if you got a church that's set up in your house, And if you love God the way you say you love him in verse 6, and if you love the saints and you want to do God's way, I'm getting ready to send you somebody. That if you accept him, you're going to have a jewel. And I can tell this by the work that he's doing for me. Paul knows that this man is doing good works. And for Paul to know that one time he was unprofitable unto you and could boldly say he's profitable unto me and I believe if you accept him back he's profitable unto you. Not to ever what job you had given him, ever what his duty was, but if you want to be a kingdom builder, you need this man. We can't be sitting around here if God sent us somebody at this church that's gifted and we're going to worry about somebody coming over here taking my place. Somebody coming in here and pushing me to. We need to get all of these ideas out of here. Right. Every year in the NFL, they draft rookies. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if you get a good rookie, he can come and turn your team around. Yeah. Anybody know anything about sport? That Detroit team, they got this. Drafted people on that team. Mm -hmm. Well, even the Texans with CJ Stroud with what they did this year. People that come in there that Lord have mercy. The church ought to be the same. But we let Satan get in our head. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was telling them, I'm waiting to see. God sent uh Deacon Gilbert, uh this is a young preacher, Carol. And it just something seemed like that boy got a gift from God. It would be a terrible thing if somebody would try to hinder him. At least see what he got. Yeah. Because the churches need help. Yeah. Don't think that we ought to be satisfied with the condition that our How can we be satisfied in our churches if we don't have no Sunday school? How can we be satisfied in our church if we don't have no children in Sunday school? Yeah. How can we be satisfied with all the empty seats in the Lord's house? Mm. Yeah. And this is why we ought to be praying to God. And a lot of people think just because the preacher wants the house filled, uh, uh, he, it's like he wants a, a, a lot of people. But the more people you have in the house, the more headaches you're going to have anyway. And I tell people, like, I don't want just a church house full of people. But what I want is a church house people that, that's full of church. And along with the problem, we can handle the problems. But the thing that we got to do is be trying to do what? Get them to Jesus Christ. To make this world that we live in a better world. You see that little child there? To make it safer for that child every day of her life. 
And this is what Paul is concerned about. He can be profitable unto you because he can help make this church grow. And look what Paul said. Paul let them know he's been profitable unto me. Paul didn't get jealous because the man was going outside. It appeared that he was covering more area than Paul was covering. Man, Satan get in our head and he just mess us up. But look what he said here in verse uh, 12. Whom I have sinned again, thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels. Uh, Paul is making the right decision. He's dealing with a runaway slave. Paul did not have to let Philemon uh, Solomon know that this man is here working with me doing good work. He had no weight. Because this man probably, when he went there, he went there running from being a slave, going all the way to Rome. Part of the thing, I, I, I'm, I'm getting ready to have a new life. I, I'm no more owned by no man. So I can get to Rome, I, I can find me a job. I'm a free man. I can start living the way I want to live and hope I run across me a good looking woman. <laughs> Not just a good looking woman, but a good woman. Because just because she look good, that doesn't mean anything. What that old record where they used to sing? Beauty's only what? Skin deep. You could be beautiful on the outside and rotten on the inside. The inside. I know this guy, I'm going to say it, I ain't going to be there but a minute, said that he had the most beautiful woman that was in the world. And he knew he wasn't the most attractive man that was in the world. Uh, and say that, you know, he loved to take his woman out and every time he take him out, somebody always looking at him. <laughs> Said he couldn't be happy because somebody always had their eyes on his woman. Say they finally, somebody got to him. And say he got out from under that pressure of always being upset because somebody was always looking at him where he took her somewhere. So he decided when I get me another woman, she ain't got to be no good looking woman. <laughs> and I won't have this problem no more. <laughs> but the man probably was thinking he just a change in life. The bottom line is getting, get, uh, getting away from being a, a slave. Where are we at? Verse 12. But Paul is making a good decision. He's making a godly decision. Once he find out the man was a runaway slave, he want to send him back. He's not just going to keep him there because of his good words. He, he wanted him to clean his life up. He, he wanted him to do the right thing for the Lord. Because there's one thing about it, if you're on the wrong, you're not never at peace. You're always looking behind him. And Paul wants the man to get his life together. But Paul is not concerned so much about him because one thing Paul knows that he's just a changed man. His concern now is, a, is about who? Philemon. Will he accept uh, this man back? And that's who he said, whom I have sent, that therefore receive him, that is, mine own bow. And he, was, he said, if you receive him, now I'm communicating with you. If you receive him, it's like you're receiving me. Whom I would have retained with me, that in my stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the God. In other words, I could use this man. Right. I would love to keep him here with me. And that's one thing we have to learn how to do is quick. We have to learn how to do the right thing. We don't always want to do the right thing. And sometimes we want to do things the way we want to do. But it's not about our will. It's always about God's will. And that's verse 13. 
Again, Paul desired. Paul wanted to keep him. That, that, you see what Paul did? Paul is denying himself of what he really wants. He, he won't want to keep him. He wanted to have him ministering. He wanted him to continue to do the good work. But no, he got something that he needed to get cleared up. Yes. Verse 14. But without that mind, would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. And that's that very 14. He talking about thy mind. Whose mind? Philemon's mind. The horn of the slave. And he's telling him that as me and you being brothers in Christ, and also I value you, Philemon, for what you're doing there in Colossae. And I want you to know what I'm going through. To keep this man here, Philemon, it will be profitable unto me. Mm -hmm. But I will not do that. Mm -hmm. I will not conceal him. I know who he is. I know he ran away from you. Now I have the responsibility to God to do what? The right thing. I'm going to send him back to you. Now once I send him back to you, now you got a decision on how you receive him back. I gave a good report on the man. Fireman is another thing that I want you to remember when I send him back to you. Because Paul know the hearts of men. And our heart is when somebody does something, the man was not profitable to him when he was there, the man ran away. Now that I'm sending him back and I'm asking you to do something, we're dealing with a subject here. A plea for Christ like begin to Paul, I mean, Philemon, the work that you're doing there in Colossae. The love that you have for the brothers, the love that you have for Jesus Christ, what are you going to do with this man? Are you going to be Christ-like? Because Christ forgave us of our wrongdoing. And if you know anything about the model prayer, it's in the model prayer to give, forgive us of our debts. That we forgive our debt to us. So what are you going to do? You're going to forgive him for his wrongdoing? You're going to beat him? You're going to sell him? You're going to mistreat him? It's in your hands. And what kind of mind do you have? Because sometimes what someone does to us has a lot of effect on what, what kind of mind we have toward that individual. That's right. He was concerned. But that's what he telling me. It's about your mind. I made my mind up to do the right thing and to send him back under your care. Verse 15, for perhaps he therefore depart for a season. Lord have mercy. This is why the Holy Spirit <laughs> is so important. Look what Paul is saying. For per perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive him forever. <laughs> Under the condition that you had him, he was always looking for an opportunity. Thank you, Sister Turner, to escape and get away. Because whatever his job was, 
whatever he was doing while he was there. The man wasn't satisfied with it. And perhaps he departed for a season. <laughs> and, and maybe it's a reason that he parted, departed for a season. Paul is really using scripture. And this is why the Holy Spirit is so powerful in our lives. <coughs> when he talks about him departing for a season. You know what the first thing ran to my mind? Wrong on 8 <laughs> and 28. For this man to skies up when the opportunity came. For this man to be on the run and for all this thing to happen the way it has happened. He's running from you who's a minister, according to what Paul said. Didn't give a red spirit. He's running from you who's a minister of God. And he ran into me who was also a minister <laughs> for God. And I believe that the reason all this is happening, Philemon, Philemon, get your, 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 your paperwork and run over to Roman 8 and, and 28. For we know, Lord have mercy, that all things work together yeah. for good to them that love the Lord, to them who've called according to God's purpose. And Paul's saying, with all this going on, I'm running from you, bumping into me, and the work that I've seen, this man have dedicated his life to the Lord. And the work that you're doing in Colossae at this young church, I'm going to send him back because I believe that it was God's purpose for all this thing to work out the way it's working out. And it's happening just for a season. God let him escape you. And he came to me. If he would stay with you, I don't believe he would never have an opportunity to show who he really is. Yeah. Right. But since he got here with me, this is a treasure. This is a jewel. Yeah. This is a man that want to take this gospel and spread it all over the world. And here I am in bond. And the man is taking the word even farther than I could take it, being locked up here in this Roman jail. Verse 16. This man is a brother in Christ. This man, you was holding him as your servant. But since he been here with me, now he's God's servant. And I'm sending him back to see how you're going to handle the situation. Not now. You hear what I'm saying? He was a slave servant at first. And this is why I say everything went for good. For those that love the Lord. Verse 16. Not now as a servant. But above a servant. A brother beloved especially to me. But how much more unto thee. Both in the flesh and in the Lord. You got something here if you just accept him back. And if you just do the right thing. No more serving under your care. But now make him a servant of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Let me throw this in, Philip. Now, you got to realize now, if you see him wanting to be the servant that he was, when you stand before God one day, what do you want to hear him say? Well done, who? So you better 
Now here you had an opportunity there to receive this service. Let me go on to verse 17. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. <clears throat> you know? So Paul is setting the tone for this man. Paul is giving him all of the, he's he really leading him into accepting this, this godly man. You know that's the way we ought to be about each other. But do, can we see that? Do we have that kind of love? Are we concerned about gift, gifted people that God is sending to us? Verse 18. If he had wronged thee, Lord have mercy. Uh, all thee, all, put that on my account. Look what Paul, Paul is a man of God, you all. Yeah. Paul didn't just run around him with words. For Paul to speak that language, what he said in verse 18, if he have wronged thee, or owed thee, oh, put that on my account. Somebody, and keep in mind, in verse 17, he's telling him about the Christ-like forgiveness that you need to show to this man. But in verse 18, somebody run to Roman 5, 6, and 8. The way Paul is presenting this man back to Philemon, if everything Paul has said about him in our first scripture, about him, Having that agape love. Five, six, and eight. Yeah. About him having faith. <clears throat> about him loving the Lord thy God. About him loving all saints. Mm -hmm. For when we were yet. Without, you, you own it. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For sca scarcely for the righteous man will one die. Mm -hmm. Yet preadventure for a good man, some would even dare to die. But God commanded his love towards us in that. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Paul, uh, 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 Adam, if he done something wrong to you, look what Christ did for us. Mm -hmm. Wow. Was Sister Turner said. If he did something wrong, which make him, I, I know you probably would say ungodly, but, but if it make him a wrongdoing man, think about this race that we're in. Think about who we are now. If he took something from you, if, if, if when he left, Heading to Rome. Say if he took some food that he knew he had to travel. Say if he got his hands on something that he could sell because he needed some money to travel with. Thank you, sister. But he could have stolen some money. He could have took something. And Paul saying, if if the man done something wrong, put it on my account. He's trying to be like Jesus was. Jesus said, why are you were yet sinners? And what a sinner means that you have sinned and you've been separated from God, but Jesus took and put all our wrongdoing on his account. And if Jesus could do that for us, whatever, if he took something from him, Paul is saying, put it on my account. I don't mind paying because I'm one knowing that Jesus, what Jesus did for me. Now, I'm talking about if he took earthly possession from you, but if Jesus went beyond that because what happened to me, I had was a, a sinner. 
I should have been cut down because I was crucified in the church, but look what God done for me. And, and, and if, if Jesus could do that for me, what could you do for this man? If he had wronged you. We wrong God when we sin. But Christ paid it all. Paul saying, if you owe anything, maybe think about the good Samaritan. When the church passed him up, when the priest passed him up, when the deacon passed him up, that's the Then here come a Samaritan, an outcast. Took the man and healed him up, put him on his beast. Took him to the hospital and said, y'all fix this man up. Here's the little money that I got in my pocket. Take this. But if this is not enough to cover the expense, when I come back, put it on my account. We don't want to put nothing on our account. This Paul is a man of God. Put it on my account. And the reason I want you to put it on my account, well, look what Jesus had put on his account for me. While I was yet a sinner, yeah. he died for us. Yeah. And one thing we all church that like that and forgot what the wages of sin is. Yeah. The wages of sin is death. Christ paid. And he didn't have paid. He paid it in food out on the hill called Carrot. Not only did he shed his treasure, but he died. Because the wages of sin is death. And if he didn't sin, he had no been to die. Why did he die? Uh, for mine. Yeah. And for yours. And if Christ could do that for us, if he took an into something from you, Lord have mercy. Forgive the man. This is about forgiveness, my brothers and my sisters. Verse 19. I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. About, I do not say to thee, how thou owe it unto me, even thine own self. And that's that verse 19. He paid himself. He's all, this is all surrounded about, if anything, I've been taken from it. And not only that, if he was working for you. Mm -hmm. And the work that he was done since he'd been ran out and, and, and you lost some wages <laughs> due to his absence. And again, Sister Porter said, if he stole some good, if he took some money on his way to Rome, people do not value. This is what Paul is saying about himself. In that verse 19, I, Paul, have read it in mine own hand. I will repay it. How about I do not say to thee how thou owe it me, even thine own self? What did Paul talking about, thou owe it me? Joe, people don't realize the gospel that we preach and to these teachers, this gospel that you don't teach, they don't know how valuable that is. Preaching and teaching of the gospel is more valuable than silver. Yes. It's more valuable than gold. And this is what Paul talking about. You owe me. Because the church that that in Colossae, who started the church? And you done coming in and inherited something that I started. You walked into a gold mine. So you owe me. But people don't look at that. They, they, and the world haven't gotten them so bad now, the world don't want to have nothing to do with the church because they're talking about the preachers getting all their money. They ain't putting money in. Huh? They're not putting money in. No, no. And we're not getting all these people money. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you pay everybody else. You pay them people in Washington. Oh. You pay people working on the fire department. You, you got a president at home on association, you pay them. You pay everybody, but nobody's trying to save your soul but the one that God have entrusted the gospel in. And this is what Paul is telling him. You owe me for what I've done for you. Because when you've been saved, let me tell y'all this. 
When you've been saved, when you really know who Jesus, I don't care what the world throw at you. We say things, Reverend Joe, we don't know what we're saying, we done heard it so much. When they say the joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And this joy that I have, the world can't take it away. I don't care what I get hit with. Sometimes I go down on my knees, but I don't stay on my knees long. I get back up and I go on by God and you know why? Because I take it to Jesus. I got problems. But I get back up and I take my problems to Jesus and get what I get back up and do. Then I have joy. And this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. And the world can't take it away. And the God that I serve, he can fix anything. And this is what Paul is trying to get over in these last few scriptures. Yea, brother. Let me, do you see it right there? Yea, brother. Let me have joy of being the Lord. Even though I'm down here in prison behind these walls, I still got joy. And this man brought me joy because of the work that he was doing. A lot of people don't understand that. Joy, just being a child of the most high God. And I believe we are part of a royal priesthood. We are a holy nature. We are the one that God had called out of darkness into the marvelous light. Yea, brother, let me joy of the Lord, of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bow in the Lord. If you do the right thing, my inner side of me is going to be joyful. And the reason it's going to be joyful, not for you just taking him, but for a joy that the Lord has sent to you. This man is valuable. And if you get him and put him here in this church in Colossus, my inside is going to be just burning up with joy. Seeing what the Lord is doing. Even now I'm here in Colossae. Verse 20, having confidence in thy obedience. Lord, Paul is thinking with a clear mind. Even though he's going all through all of this. But I got confidence in thy obedience. I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Never get comfortable with giving God your best. Having confidence. And this confidence that Paul was saying, have confidence to please, not just please me, but also please the Lord we serve. Right. Knowing this, for this man to do run away from you, and like we say, if he owe you, if he took something, if he had a job and you lost wages on how long he been gone, could you put all that behind you, fill them? And the thing that I want to know that you did to have this joy in me, that I know that you forgave this man. And not only just to say it, but let it be living proof. Because these early scriptures, we talked about love. And it's the love we're talking about is not the love that the world knows. This is agape love, unconditional love. It's the kind of love that the Father showed towards us. In all our wrongdoing, he should have cut us down. But rather than cutting us down, he allowed his son to hang out yonder on Calvary. To wash away all our sins. You can't go to Calvary. You can't die for him. But you can't forgive him. And not only do I want you to forgive him. I want you to love that brother. Love him the way God told us to love. Our first love is to love God. With all our heart. All our soul. And all our mind. And then love one another as your own self. Yeah. And when you got this kind of love, this is what pleased God. 
my brothers and my sisters and those that are online, this lesson is to teach God's family, the church, that we are to love one another. We are to forgive one another. Remember this about this lesson. Paul praised Solomon of the love that he had toward the Lord and toward the saints that was there with him in Colossae. But this man who appeared that he had done him wrong, you can't pick and choose who you're going to love. If you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, how about a brother or sister who have done you wrong? How about a brother or sister who owe you something? Put all that stuff behind you and, and love them anyway. This whole lesson is about love and forgiving one another. And Paul saying it, it brought joy to Paul, who is an apostle of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for this man to do what he was right, he was going to bring joy to the Father and the Son, forgiving one another, even as God have forgave us. He forgave us of all our wrongdoing, sent a plan of salvation, that his Son came and cleaned up the mess that we made. And God who sit in high with all that power he allowed everything to happen to his son on that Thursday night. He allowed him to hang out yonder on Calvary Cross. He allowed him to cry to the Father, why have thou forsaken me? Because God turned his back on his own son. God did all that because he loved him. Allow him to die. Yeah. Allow him to be buried. But he didn't stay dead. Nor did he stay in the grave. He got up early on the third day morning. Was down here for 40 days. And after 40 days, he went back home to be with the Father. And every time we mess up down here, and God sees us messing up down here, we have somebody on the right hand of the Father. And every time we mess up and God check with the son. All the son had to do is tell him about care and let him know that one of mine that's covered by the blue. And once God does that, you know what God does? Help me somebody. He forgive us of all our wrongdoing. And this lesson has led us to know, learn how to forgive one another. And Paul said if he could do that, it brought joy to him. When we learn how to forgive one another, it brings joy to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Don't hold grudges. Because the one that holds the grudge, do you know who the miserable one is? The person that's holding the grudge. It's the one that's holding the grudge. Mm -hmm. While that other person is going on about their business. Mm -hmm. And Satan will let you hold that grudge. Sometimes it'd be like the, what that, the McCoys and the Hatfields and the McCoys. People live all their life mm -hmm. holding oh, garbage yeah. on the inside of them mm -hmm. and call themselves a child of God. Never forget who forgave us. This is a great lesson. When I started out on this, I was having a problem with it because it was a slave on But the Holy Spirit transformed this man to make him the man who he was. Let us bow heads in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this lesson. 
we, we thank you for just being God all by yourself. Lord, we pray that you would help us. We come short in forgiving one another. And if we are serious to our own self, we know that it's never Christ-like forgiving. Because while we were yet sinner, he chose to die for us. Oh, Father, just help us these little things that pops up in our lives. Oh, teach us, Lord. Just like your Holy Spirit, we know that it was in this lesson. We know that it was in the Apostle Paul. Uh, we know that this man, we don't know the results, but I believe in my heart he accepted him back to come to strengthen that church in Colossae. Oh, Father, just help us in time like this. Well, thank you, Father. One of our brothers had been down and out. Brother Jefferson, you healed him. These miracles, Father, I see with my own eyes that you're doing right before the Green Meadow Church and the Green Meadow family. Yes. Father, one that's been with us a long time here at the church, one that's been fighting, one that's shed many tears, wounded heart have been hurt many occasions because she wanted her daughter. And look what you're doing, Lord. Place the daughter under her care. And the joy that I see in her face, I can see it, Lord. All of the praise, Lord. All of the glory, Lord, yes, yes. Father, it all belong to you. Yes. You've been mighty, mighty good to the Green Meadow family. Thank you. Sister Turner just showed me of another blessing on our way in. You're so good to the church. Yes. Continue to bless the church. Continue to, continue to strengthen the church. Yes, bless our youth department in your own way. Well, if you send us children, Lord, we do the best that we can to raise up in the fear and the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ. We have so much to be thankful for, Lord. You've been mighty, mighty good to us. We give you all the praise, and we give you all the, the glory. And the thing that we do, we take no credit for nothing that goes on down here positive. We just do the best we can but it's all done in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We can't do nothing on our own, but with you, Lord. We do know that all things are possible. You have kept us. You have binded us. You have helped us to meet all our necessary needs. But, Lord, we want to do your will. Take this gospel away. Paul, seeing a runaway slave, join up with him and spread the gospel in Rome beyond limits that he could not go. Oh, Lord, give us a mind to spread this gospel to help save this nation of America. In Jesus' name, this is our prayer. Amen, and we thank you.